Okay, so while Chad is setting up, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our second keynote speaker, uh, Professor Chad Jenkins from the University of Michigan. Chad is an associate professor in computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan. He's also um, the editor-in-chief of the ACM Transactions on Human-Robot Interaction. <laughs> I keep introducing people who are bending behind the, the podium. Uh, okay, so Chad got his undergrad at uh, Alma College, his master's at Georgia Tech, and his PhD at the University of so Southern California in 2003. Before uh, joining Michigan, he was a professor at Brown in computer science. Um, his interest, and we'll talk a little bit about some of them, are interactive robotics and human-robot interaction. He's the founder of the Robot Web Tools Open Source uh, Robotics Organization, and he has, uh, as our as all of our speakers, a whole bunch of awards, including the, the PCASE, the Presidential Early Career uh, for Scientists and Engineers in the US, uh, the Young Investigator Award from the, from the Office of Naval Research, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and the NSF Career Award. Uh, yeah. Power. We didn't think about this. All right, can you, can you switch me over? All right. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for, for having me, Hadas and Nathan's running a great conference. It's a real honor and a pleasure to, to be here speaking with you. Um, I just want to start off by showing a picture of me um, and, and asking you, uh, so I've, I've, I've been on campuses for, for well over two decades. Uh, I want to just get, your, get your, your thoughts on which question do you think I get the most when I'm on campus? What do people ask me the most? Any guesses? What's that? I don't get that. Oh, my students give me that one, but I don't get that. Yeah. Any, any other guesses? Am I what? What year am I? I get that. Uh, that's, that's a good one. Actually, the, the question I get the most is, uh, um, is this not working? Whoops. Uh, am I with the football team? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I still have that. I still have that sort of sort of look about it, and uh, and I usually just start with a polite no. Uh, but I did play. I, but uh, and have, and if you've seen how big those guys are, I'm not really in that league. And to just give a sense of it, when I was in grad school, my diversion was to was to play rugby. And you can see that I'm I'm sizable, but not not nearly one of the big guys right there. Um, so always have something to keep your mind off of research while you're in grad school. Just a just a quick thought. Um, what question do you think I get, get next most off? My, my next most frequent question. And I over here was kind of close to it. It usually is, uh, it usually is uh, when will I graduate? Uh, and that's why I wear the glasses now. My, 40th, my body's 40th birthday party present to me is uh, glasses. And so usually I can, I can say, well, you know, I'm, I'm faculty in computer science. I'm getting more distinguished as I, as I grow older. And, uh, and, uh, and what I actually do is I program autonomous robots. And so I talk about robots like the PR2. So you've seen people talk about the PR2. And we had one when I was at, when I was at Brown. And we get lots of visitors to our lab that usually ask me things like, is that a real job? Uh, and yes, I tell you, I say, robots are a real job. And with kids and, and even their parents and various adults, that leads to a number of, of other questions that I get. I usually get a slew of these questions. Um, you know, <laughs> each of those have their, has their own pros and cons. But I'd like in this talk to really, to really focus on three of these. Um, will robots take over the world? Where is my robot? And can your robot give me a drink? And I think there are some, some, some interesting, interesting answers to these questions. And I'll start with, will robots take over the world? And my answer to that is no. Robots aren't nearly that smart. Maybe we as a community, as a robotics community, will make robots that smart, but they're nowhere near that right now. And in fact, I think robots will be helping humanity. Um, the, I think there are things that, that we are going to do. We control the, the future of robotics, and I think we, could, we can do it the right way. And so a canonic, uh, common example of this is a TED Talk we did with a collaborator, Henry Evans. Um, and Henry uh, suffered a stroke. Is that video playing? Uh, Henry suffered a stroke when he was about 40 years old, uh, which was about, I think, 18 years, 18 years ago. And he relies on other people to do things for him. And I think being able to help people like Henry and others uh, who are aging uh, or, or people with disabilities uh, to be able to do things on their own. 
And so one thing that, that I thought was really amazing was that uh, you can't see it says Georgia Tech Healthcare Robotics. Charlie is very uh, sensitive to that. So I'll, I'll say the Georgia Tech and Charlie Kemp's group, uh, you know, basically used, uh, used uh, some of the software that we've developed along with the PR2 to help Henry start to do things on his own, be able to consume a meal, uh, be able to, uh, be able to, to scratch an itch, uh, be able to do things on his own and live independently. And so lots of people are involved in this, in this project, and I thought, it was, I thought it was really cool. One of the things that Charlie, who's going to show up in the lower corner of the screen right now, uh, with that sort, of, that sort of face of awe, I think that was, that was really cool, because I was amazed by it when I saw this too. This was the first time that Henry was able to sh shave his face in 10 years. And I thought that was, that was amazing to give that capability back to him. Um, our part in this is that we, con we contributed the robot web tools framework. And so this is an ongoing project from my, from my lab that's been going on for, for, for a number of years. And really what Robot Web Tools has been about is how can we create TCP LIP like interoperability for robotics. We take the internet for granted these days. And we need protocols that are going to, network protocols that are going to be simple, easy to use, like TCP IP, but suited for robotics applications. And so we created the Ross Bridge Network Protocol, which, which, is, which has done this and provided all sorts of interoperability between different middleware systems, cloud, cloud, cloud and, and web robotics, different programming languages. You name the runtime environment, Ross Bridge has been able to make those connections and stream point cloud data and all sorts of stuff. And so this has been really good. Um, and so when Henry met me, uh, we, he basically said, I want to fly drone. And I, within, within, the, within a, a couple of minutes, uh, within the hour, I had the drone flying and I created, a web, I created uh, a web interface for Henry that just allowed him to use it. Nice big buttons, a good display where he could see the, the, the camera from the robot, from the drone. And before I knew it, we were at Henry's house and we were, we were off and running. And so this is Henry basically flying the drone on his own, um, being able to do things, being able to fly and move around in a way that he hadn't been able to experience for some time. And I thought that was amazing. This was one of the most fulfilling, to some extent, bittersweet uh, uh, projects that, that really fuels me to think about how can we allow our, uh, how can we enable independent living for aging and disabled populations uh, through robotics. But it's not just about creating interfaces for one person. Uh, this protocol has been used for a number of different types of robots. Uh, there are all sorts of, all sorts of uh, um, interfaces and applications that, that Rossbridge has been used for to basically provide a vid bridge between, uh, between a number of different types of systems. And so usually we're thinking about manipulation in these cases. And so, uh, and so I think what, we're, what we, and Rossbridge was really only just the first step in this regard, providing general interoperable robots for getting robots out of the lab and to work with people. And so, uh, and so this project has been, has, is, is readily available, it's open source, uh, lots of people use it. Um, we have a JavaScript uh, client, that, uh, that uh, client library that Jihoon Lee basically manages that project and we've had over 15,000 downloads this year. Um, we also, my, my, uh, my Russell Torres, who's one of my, my collaborators on this project, we also see interesting behavior in the number of downloads that we get from for RWT. And so, uh, so this is actually showing from September 16th, 2015, a big spike in activity. And we were sitting there thinking, well, what's going on? Why is this, why is this spike happening? And uh, it turns out, well, that's the difference between the paper, ICRA paper deadline, ICRA video deadline, uh, which tells us, I think, the robotics community is getting some use out of this. Um, and when people hear that, they say that sounds awesome and cool and, you know, sort of Silicon Valley-esque, like the TV show. And, but a build system and a robot protocol does not get you a robot that's working. So it usually leads to the question of, so where is my robot? Where is our robot coming? Where is, where is going to be the robot of the future that people are actually going to use? And I say your robot's here. The Fetch, PR2, these are robots where the PR2 you can't buy anymore. But the Fetch, you can buy one, right? And with these robots, uh, they ask, how much would it cost for me to get one of these robots? And the answer is still is about $100,000. And that's, you know, within manageability for, manageability for, a, for, a, federal, for a federal grant uh, or a project, maybe not, maybe not uh, viable for a home robot just yet. But if you think about the trend of where these robots are going, the first robot I worked with was the NASA Robonaut, and I'm guessing it cost about a million five. If we go back to linear algebra and we fit our polynomial through this and we look at the trend line, don't forget about least squares, <laughs> especially at this conference, um, and uh, 
your, I would guess that your robot is actually being built right now. It's either conceived of or being built. And it's going to show up in 2020 for about 40K. And it's going to get cheaper and cheaper in price. And the Robonaut, there's a few of those were built. The PR2 had about 50 or 60 built. The Fetch, I don't know. They're probably in the hundreds right now. The number of robots that are going to be built are going to be in the thousands. So mirroring the, the computer, the personal computer revolution. And when we think about the types of robots that are being built and the autonomy that's going on these robots, there are certain evolutions that have taken place with that as well. So when I was a graduate student, we had the NASA Robonaut, everything was done primarily through teleop, remote control. And with the rise of laser range finding and depth sensors, we started to have what we call, what I would call, put that there. Take something from point A, bring it to point B. And that's really sort of navigation. That's what sensor and perception have provided. And where we want to go next is to be able to say, robot, do this task for me. Here's a goal, I want you to achieve this goal, and I just want you to clean up the room, make dinner, assemble this furniture, you know, uh, clean the yard for me, and be able to reason on all the actions and motions to do that on your own. And this do this task for me really is not just do this task for me, it's really asking can we build a programmable world? Can we say I want these things to go over here, and I want you to do this with that thing over there, and this is what the world should look like. And can the robot then say, I hear what you want me to do, and I'm going to figure out how to do it on my own. And that, those types of environments and those types of things that the robot has to work with, um, we really are going to face all sorts of different types of environments, different types of things that we want the, what the robot to do. And I, can really, I really think about this problem as, how do we take an arbitrary robot and have it perform an arbitrary task in an arbitrary environment, no matter how cluttered or how difficult that environment may be, assuming that the robot is physically capable. And this, this problem usually falls into what we call learning from demonstration, or in a, tri in a traditional context, kinesthetic learning from demonstration. And so we're usually showing the robot what we want it to do, and then the robot is, is taking all of those demonstrations and trying to generalize those, usually as trajectories and configuration space, and then having a smart way of replaying that back. The problem is, is that when we think about how we can generalize from this, it usually means that our demonstrations are limited to proprioceptive, so something that's in the configuration space of the robot. So these demonstrations are usually trajectories in configuration space. That leads to a procedural do this, do that, then this type of programming style, which is really only useful for replaying robot behavior. And so when I think about the next generation of learning from demonstration that we want, that we want to be able to, to achieve, uh, we're going to, I think the, the critical aspect of that is not just to do per proprioceptive perception on encoders and things like that, but to get exteroceptive scene perception. This is what's happening in the world. If you can do scene perception, then we can do demonstrations in workspace. Take this object and move it over here. And that workspace demonstrations can be, then be something we can generalize at the scene level to do, dem to do declarative programming your prologue style, here's a goal, then achieve this programming, this, this, uh, this, this goals type of programming. And that will lead us to do more than just replay, but actually to be able to do goal-directed behavior and teach that to our robots and have it learn such in a very intuitive fashion. Uh, this approach to the next generation of what we're calling what, this next generation of, of learning from demonstration really is trying to take all the great things that are happening in semantic mapping and those ideas about how we can understand the world and, and the different types of objects and what kind of affordances they have. And combine that with developments with the, the long-standing body of research in AI based off of programming by planning. Your STRIPS planner, your POMDP, uh, cognitive architectures, all of those planners are there. If we can build that bridge, we can generate this next generation of learning from demonstration, which my group is calling semantic robot programming as a merger of semantic mapping and robot programming. And in semantic robot programming, what we're trying to do is have a user just demonstrate to the, to the robot, this is what I want the, the scene of the world to look like. And from that, we infer conditions, goal conditions, on what the, on what the user's intended world would be. From that, we're going to, the, the robot, the, the user demonstrates to that. We use a combination of neural networks with probabilistic generative inference to infer the, the poses of the objects in the scene and their inner object relationships. This is now stored as a scene graph in PDDL. We were, the robot then remembers that goal, and then at some later time, it, it encounters the, the world in a, in a new, different state. And its goal is to try and bring the world back to that goal state. So we do the same process of understanding the scene, of um, 
of doing perception, understanding the poses, the inner object relationships, these now give us a collection of actions that we have in PDDL. We can then run a planner to generate, the, um, to generate a plan that gets us from the, current scene, from the current scene to the goal scene. And our robot can then act out the, that plan. And so this is just showing an example of this, where the robot basically is only given from the user a demonstration of here's where I want the objects to be, and the robot figures everything out else out to figure out what actions to take, what motions to do, assuming that the world stays mostly static. Um, these systems don't run real time. And even more so, the, we're not really thinking about exact metric representations. We're only interested in, have, in, in, in achieving the goal conditions that we were inferred from the, users in, from the user's demonstration. And we're trying to do this in, the, in these cases where we can, where we can have the, the goal and achieve, we have the user's desired goal and we have the achieved goal but again, not necessarily a metric reproduction, but a topological reproduction based off of the inner object relationships. And we've run this for, a mini di for, for several, different, several different situations. So up in the left-hand corner is the goal that was demonstrated to the, to the robot. And what you're seeing in, in each square is what the robot's doing to, to achieve the goal, to execute. And really, these are just pick and place actions right now, but we eventually want to see this, see this where we can do more interesting, um, more interesting manipulation actions that might in involve turning something, screwing something, uh, basic, uh, you know, uh, applying, a, applying a trigger or anything like that. Um, and so we're, we're sort of building from there right now. And so this system actually works pretty well, and this is sort of a prototype of what this type of declarative style of, of learning from demonstration could be. All of this presupposes that we can do scene estimation and clutter. Uh, so what we need to be able to do is, is get observations of point clouds or RGBD and be able to infer object poses and the relationships. We're gonna assume we know the geometry for now, but we have considerable uncertainty due to the physical, the physical interactions between these objects. And we wanna be able to do this in natural human environments. So we wanna avoid many of the crutches that we've seen in robotics thus far. No green screens, no AR tags, all of those things. And I think we can do this. I think, I think this is really within, within reach. And what gives me hope that this is happening is all the advancements that have occurred for autonomous cars. And so this is the Michigan Next Generation vehicle that was worked on uh, several years back by Ed, my colleagues at Michigan, Ed Olson and Ryan Eustace. And based off the laser rangefinders that are on top of there, they can build absolutely beautiful maps. And so this is a map that they built of the football stadium in downtown Ann Arbor. And when people see these, these maps, it's very clear what's happening, what, what you're looking at. From the human eye, we can understand that that's a building and those are trees and that's a car over there. And we can see those things. It's still very hard, but for the computer, it's still just a collection of points. It still is, you know, di this disparate data that we need to put together. Bless you, by the way. Um, um, and so, how do we un how do we start to infer the semantics of these types of, of these types of objects, of these types of scenes? And I believe it's within reason. And in order to do this, what we've been what we've been doing in terms of scene estimation is taking an approach that's been that I think has been incredibly successful for autonomous navigation where you use probabilistic inference to do localization, where, where the uncertainty is, is, is really needed. So Monte Carlo localization and, and things like that, that's where you have probab probabilistic, um, that's where you use probabilistic methods. And you maintain probability mass there. And then, from, and then during your probabilistic inference, at any moment in time, you'll take an estimate off, and then you'll do symbolic deterministic fast reasoning, your A star planner and your PID controller. And if we take that approach to navigation, that has been very, very, um, very successful, we apply it to manipulation, we, get, we can have a very similar approach where we'll, use, we'll do probabilistic inference on scenes, but we're gonna then take an estimate off that, dis, that distribution that we're maintaining, although a very high dimensional distribution, and then be able to do task planning, motion planning, and motion control in a, in a symbolic deterministic manner. And our approach to this is really we've been focusing on scene estimation and some of our recent work in this is, is, uh, is, is a recent paper we had at IROS doing um, what we call sequential scene understanding and manipulation. Uh, so in this case, the, the robot is being able to, has to be able to determine, has to recognize which objects are in the scene, localize them, and separate them into two different bins. So in this case, it's separating them into laundry items or la laundry cleaning items and not laundry items. Uh, you'll notice that 
The robot here picks up the Comet dishwashing uh, liquid and puts it in the laundry bin. That is, a, that is, a, that is an error. Um, although it's not the robot's fault, it's because my students don't do a lot of laundry. And, <laughs> and they just don't, and they don't understand that they should have gone another bin. But, uh, but usually this works out pretty well. This, this system is, is based off of the handle grasp localization system of, uh, that Rob Platt did from, from Northeastern, and that's how we're getting grasp. For perception, what we're doing is we're using RCNN in order to local, in order to give us an initial guess of which objects are in the scene. From that, we generate candidates of what objects could be in the scene and, uh, or what different pod types of configurations of objects or, or combinations of objects could be in the scene. And then we use uh, a probabilistic method, uh, particle-based search, in order, to, uh, in order to figure out which, where the likely objects, where could, where could the likely objects be, eliminate some of, the, some of the, the bad recognitions, and then plan a grasp on objects that we've seen before. And this is how this system works over and over. Um, and so we've been able to do this, and, and one thing that's really important is that we can maintain belief over time of what we think the scene should be. And so we think this is going to bring some computational tractability to this very high dimensional problem. In addition, we've had a number of other challenges for semantic robot programming. Tractable inference is, is a big issue for this high dimensional problem. We think both physics and context are, 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 are issues that we have to address, and so we've been thinking about physics in this way. Um, one of the things that also we notice is that our, our scenes, are, our, our environments are filled with translucent, transparent objects. And so we've developed a polynoptic Monte Carlo localization that's built on some of the ideas that, that have appeared in this conference that, are, that we think are pretty good and, and useful for, for dealing with real human environments. Uh, we have to be able to infer more about the types of affordances that the robot can do, the types of goal conditions that are being demonstrated, and I really believe that we should start to move beyond the tabletop. We should put the mobile back in mobile manipulation and be able to work more, more, uh, more broadly. And so this is sort of where, where our agenda is going on. Also, if you, if you, I also have, can, can talk a lot about non-parametric belief propagation. I, I believe non-parametric belief propagation is ready for a comeback, so, um, so that's another thing. And this leads me to the last question I'd like to, I'd like to pose, which is, uh, which is that, that I usually get, which is, uh, can your robot bring me a drink? And I've been in robotics long enough that I know that drink doesn't mean drink, it actually means beer. Um, <laughs> Which you probably, which you probably, probably know, and the answer to that is sure, no problem. We've done this many, many times. We've seen this over and over and over again. So, uh, so there's the Willow Garage, uh, you know, bring me a beer, and we've had various hackathons where we, where we bring people drinks and beers, and those are those are all good. Um, but uh, but really, the problem with this is that it usually asks. It usually generates people, a question for people, have you seen Silicon Valley? The minute they see the, the PR2 and it's drinking beer, uh, have, you, have you seen this TV show where it's, a bunch, it's about a bunch of tech entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley who believe that everything that they're doing, every piece of technology they're generating is making the world a better place? Um, and so we have, you know, elegant code hierarchies for maximal code re reuse and extensibility, making the world a better place. Uh, ask fault tolerant distributed databases, making the world a better place. And the one that, that really that really hit me came from uh, from from the, the Hooli, from Hooli, which is one of the big uh, Silicon Valley fictional Silicon Valley conglomerates. Uh, their their CEO, who uh, who um, who's, who's sort of a you know sort of a shady character sometimes. He basically said that Hooli is about making the world a better place through minimal message oriented transport layers. And this one just hit me to my core, because if you take out Hooli and you place it with Rossbridge, then really, <laughs> really what they're doing is talking about me. <laughs> and I don't really know if I'm, you know, and am and, and, and I really making the world a better place? Am I saying that? Is that just words that are coming out of my mouth? And the question I always ask myself is, am, it, will my work make, make the world a better place? I love what we do technolo technologically. I love hearing the talks that we have. We're in, a, we're in a great position to be able to define the future of humanity and what it will look like. But will that make the world a better place? I don't know. And I want to talk about some things that I, that I wrestle with in this regard. And so when I think about my priorities, I want to be innovative and excellent. We want to be great at what we do. That's why we're here. That's why we have these, these long discussions about interesting technical problems. But at the same time, I want to create equal opportunity. 
And my typical state sort of is on the border of this. It kind of goes back and forth. What you'll find with a lot of minorities in, in computer science and robotics is that we're trying to ask ourselves, is my job to be the best roboticist, scientist, computer scientist possible and be an example for everybody else? Or is my job to help others who, who are underrepresented in computing move along and, 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 and come into computing. And so, because it takes time away from doing research to, to be involved in efforts for diversity. And so we kind of go back and forth, and I kind of sit on that line. But these two things aren't enough. You also have to be able to create an economic incentive. What you have to do actually has to provide value to society somewhere. And in our ideal world, we'd be at the Voronoi vertex of these, of these, three, these three priorities. And what worries me is that we, we are sort of, the field is sort of somewhere out here where equal opportunity is not necessarily a priority that we value. And to take a look at this, if we think about equal opportunity, this, this I got from a report from Intel, uh, it talks about the, the, the distribution of, of people, uh, of gender representation, of representation with respect to minorities, and the numbers don't look very good. In fact, I'd say these numbers are, are, as, are trying to be as positive as possible. If you read the, the Talby report from the Computing Research Association, these numbers are actually worse than this. And it means that we are not necessarily creating, a, creating equal opportunity. In fact, what this is called in the civil rights terms is disparate impact. It's not that you're trying to discriminate, anybody's trying to discriminate, but the system as a result of how it operates is leading to disparities. And those disparities are a big problem. And so when you look at this disparate impact, uh, you know, robotics is, no, is, is not, is not, uh, is not um, immune from this. And so last year, it was, very, it was kind of disappointing to see that no minorities appeared on stage. No, no, minority per, uh, no intellectual contribution from minorities really appeared on the program. Nick, by the way, that's you up there, so just so you know. Uh, <laughs> um, and, you know, and RSS, is not the only one, so IROS in, in, in also had its, had its issues, so I try, to make, I try to meet every minority that I, that I see at the conferences, I counted about 30, optimistically out of 3,000, so 1%. Um, this is a big problem, and, um, and, I, and I would and argue the reason why it's a big problem, it make, you should think about the word robot in and of itself. We are robotics, what are we doing? That defines what we're doing. So I, you should think about that word robot. What does that word robot mean? Where does it come from? Well, everybody starts our, every robotics class should start off with saying the term robot came from Czech playwright Carol Chopik uh, in his play Rossin's Universal Robots from 1920. Um, and that word actually came from, 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 uh, from, from Chopik's brother, Yosef. And it came from the word uh, robota, robota. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, somebody from, from Czech Republic can, can correct me, but, uh, but really that word means forced labor, surf slave. And that is, and that really is what we're talking about. We're talking, when we're building robots, we're talking about building an exploitable labor force that we can ask to do things 24-7. And we don't really have to pay them other than maintenance costs. And so, uh, and so this word slave actually is used a lot. Uh, it's actually used in our, uh, <laughs> it's used all throughout science fiction, I actually used this morning. So, so I, I took a picture of Catherine talking about it. So, um, I know she's doing it in a different context, but I thought I would be, thought it'd be funny. Um, and, but I think this issue of, of, of labor and how we're changing labor is a big, big issue that we should, we, sh we as the people who are developing this technology need to really, really talk about and be a part of that discussion. And when I think about labor and my country's history of this, I, I'm gonna be, a, I'm gonna talk very much from a U.S. perspective right now. I think about people like Mary Turner. Um, and so this, this, is, this is somewhat of a troubling story. Uh, no, it's a very troubling story. Uh, Mary Turner, about 100 years ago, was living in Valdosta, Georgia. And when she came, and, and basically an angry mob came to her home and strung her up by a tree, upside down, while she was eight months pregnant, cut the baby out of her stomach, it fell onto the ground, somebody killed that baby by stomping on it with his boot, and then they shot her dead. And you should ask yourself, why would somebody do that to another person? That doesn't make any sense. It's just mean for no reason. But it does make sense if you think about it from a labor perspective. Those people didn't go to kill, to, to kill Mary Turner. What they did was they wanted to instill fear 
in their labor force. The reason, they, they, the reason that mob came out is because there was a, a plantation owner who'd been, who basically needed a lot of labor. He got exploited cheap labor from the community. He went to jails and, and basically took people who had been convicted of crimes and used them as on chain gangs on, on his plantation and treated them really badly, exploited them. And one, once somebody got fed up, shot the, the plantation owner and killed him, and then the rest of the community basically came and killed about 15 people just to make a point, to instill fear and hostility in the labor force so they could still be exploited. And fortunately, we are 100 years away from that, and we don't have that same mentality right now, Colin Kaepernick aside. Um, <laughs> but we have replaced, uh, we have replaced the, our, our need for labor with automation. We are now in an automated economy that's, that, that we are contributing to the exponential growth, the awesome, amazing ex exponential growth that, it, that started from 1965 and Moore's Law. And this is technology that I use, that I, that I work with, and I think is, is, is amazing. But we also have seen an exponential growth in incarceration. As we have automated more things, we have left people behind, and traditionally these are going to be minorities, and that exponential growth has led to, to vast mass incarceration as Michelle Alexander talks about in her book, The New Jim Crow. And what this is really saying is that, we, that in our priorities, what disparate impact looks like in terms of its causes is that we think of equal opportunity as sort of a separate thing, and we really think about venture capital and federal funding and, and, uh, and creating new intellectual property as sort of our motivating drivers. And that sort of comes from the Moore's Law way of thinking about things. And we would like to be able to, and, and in order to, to address that disparate impact, you have to treat all of, these, all of these, these factors as equal priorities. And I think the thing that most disturbed me, you know, RSS is a great place, you know, you, you have to go with the submissions that, that you have. Um, but, and you know, conferences will be conferences. But the thing that disturbed me the most was the National Robotics Initiative meeting, which I was fortunate to be a part of. I'm fortunate to have National Robotics Initiative funding, but I was one of eight people, eight minorities. And this is both African American and Hispanic out of 257 participants. That means that, that the money that's funding the future, that is deciding who is going to shape the minds and shape the technology of the future, is largely, minorities are largely excluded from that. And not only they're excluded, but they're not really having a say in, a, in, a te in the technology that will have a big impact on them. And so that is, that is a disparity that keeps me up at night more than anything else. But the, but the good thing is, is that there's a fix that I think is relatively straightforward that incentivizes equal opportunity. And most of this is actually on the books already. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 has, two, has a number of things in it, uh, two titles, that basically pre prevents discrimination in, in agencies that receive federal funding and it prohibits discrimination by, by race, color, sex, national origin, and it's done great things in, in, our, in our society. But really, we're talking about higher education. All of us are, are usually come through or associated with, with, with universities and colleges, and that higher education is really what, has, what, is, what is the game changer. And I think the thing, and, and we can take some solace from Title IX of the Educational Amendments Act of 1972. And Title IX has, I think, has created, uh, basically has created a, a, a culture that has been, that is more gender inclusive than, than, than it is now. If I think about robotics when I first started, and the number of women that are at, the, at, these con at, at the conferences, it is a very small fraction both in, uh, in, uh, than, what we, than what we see today. And that is partially because of Title IX, which says that, that in higher education, any place that is get any institution that's getting federal funding cannot, can, must provide equal opportunity, equal access based off of gender. Um, and so this is uh, President Nixon signing, signing something. Uh, I'd love to say that it, he was signing the Title IX uh, and it came out to much fanfare, but he's actually signing the, uh, the Clean Water Act because there's no picture of uh, President Nixon signing this. Um, it was actually released to, to very little fanfare and very little concern, um, but it had a huge impact. Um, we see it primarily in athletics, but also in terms of the campus culture and in the classroom. And there's, uh, there's a number of things that, that Title IX addresses, but really I wanna focus on equitable participation. 
And that basically means that, there's a, that, that, that the three prongs of Title IX say that you have, that you have a, a test, you have certain tests for equal participation, primarily based on statistics. Is the ratio of, number, the, ratio of the number of, of, of women proportional to the number of men that are participating in, in some activity of concern on campus, which could be athletics or the number of scholarships and so forth? And are universities creating an, a culture that will be accommodating to, to women? And I think it's time to modernize Title, title IX uh, to, um, to think about not just, not just uh, athletics, but to think about science funding on the whole, and also expand it to, to thinking about broader particip participation for minorities. And so I would, I would offer these, these, these changes to Title IX for how, to think, how we should think about it. Um, but this is a big policy concern and you don't really have the ability to do policy. Actually, most of us are, are focused on what we need to do. We need to get our papers out. We need to get our grants funded. We got deadlines. We can't, we can't be in Washington lobbying for, for policy efforts. So, but there is something that you can do in terms of, in, in terms of, um, in terms of creating equal opportunity in the sciences. And that really is, is, is that you should try to eliminate double standards in your own behavior. And that will eliminate the disparate impact, I believe. And I ask myself these questions all the time. I ask myself, am I consistent in how I treat my colleagues, regardless of their gender or race or national origin or age? Am I consistent in how I treat my students? Am I consistent in how I treat applicants who want to come to the, to the University of Michigan? How intellectually diverse is my research lab? Are people getting a shot? It doesn't mean that I necessarily have to have an even distribution or a, a uniform, uh, a representative distribution, but I need to make sure that everybody has, an, has, a, has a chance. Is my citation list uh, intellectually diverse? Is my classroom diverse? Are the committees who I select to be on committees and do work with me, is that diverse? And I think this is something that anybody can do in terms of how you just live your life. And I know that Title IX has had a big impact on me, and so here's just some of the people that, that, I, that, that have enabled, you know, a dorky, nerdy, African-American guy who, um, who just, who, who, who can't control himself sometimes, is jittery and, and, uh, and squirrely, uh, to actually have a, have a career in computer science and robotics because I love what we, what we do, and I'm actually trying to pass that onto my students and how we, how we conduct ourselves in our lab. And I, and I think if we can do this, we can actually, we can actually achieve these things that we want, we want uh, for equal opportunity, excellence, and, and economic incentives. And I think, we, and, and I think I can, that what we're doing in our lab and we, what we think we can do is do that through thinking about the next generation of learning from demonstration. Think about how we can get robots to real people doing real things through, 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 uh, through message-based control, uh, through message-based based protocols. And we believe that we can eliminate these disparate impacts by modernizing Title IX. And so with that, I am done. And I thank you for, any other, for, for listening and any other questions you might have. For an amazing, insightful talk. Um, questions? There are a bunch of different topics that Chad uh, addressed, and I think uh, questions about any aspect of it would be really uh, great. Oh, Ross, yeah. Uh, microphone over there. Check. Okay, great. Chad, thanks for a wonderful talk, and I appreciate. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry, I appreciate the um, diversity pitch at the end, and I want to comment on something that I think you agree with, but your visualization may uh, deceive some of us a little bit. Right. Yeah. I don't think that incorporating diversity, it's not a zero sum game. Yeah. So the visualization makes it look like we have to have less impact in order to be diverse. I think the opposite is true. I think that the reason that we like to incorporate this diversity is actually because it realizes dividends that we may not realize a priori. Um, that's what right. I wanted to say. Right. No, I, 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 well, I will also say that one thing that comes, that comes along with, uh, with, with working robotics and being faculty is sleep deprivation and not having enough time. And, you know, and, and most of these slides got done on flights and, and within the last week or so. so. So I wouldn't say that it's perfect. These are new thoughts, and I'm trying to, to start a, a, a new discussion amongst our, amongst our, our, our community. And, and, I don't, and this is not a zero-sum game at all. 
right? This is, what it's really meant to say is, is that we should, we should try to provide equal access. And, and some people are going to, going to gravitate it and gra gravitate to what we do and do it well. Others may need to find another, another profession. Um, you know, those are, those are all factors, but I think it's really about how can we all work together to, to achieve, uh, achieve goals that are, that are mutually beneficial. I guess just to follow up a little bit, um, there are other kinds of diversity that we don't always see when we look around in conferences. So right. Disabilities, um, orientation, so that I think we are more diverse than we realize. Right, right. Uh, I, I, I would agree with that, and, and I think it's, I, 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 just seeing what, how robotics has, has evolved over, over time, I think seeing more diversity, more diversity can be, that can be expressed, I think, is a good thing, and I, I would agree with you on that. Uh, yeah, thanks for that really illuminating talk. I think the points you raised about diversity were very important to me on a personal level. Um, I think as a student, uh, I can, I can, we can immediately think of things that we as individuals can do, but I was wondering if you had thoughts on, I mean, the amount of impact that a graduate student versus an institution collectively can have varies a lot. And I had wondering if you had thoughts on what you think advisors who may have more of a mm -hmm. broader perspective on things or a broader incentive on things, or even at a higher level departments and institutions, what they can do to make it easier for individual students to give more time to these aspects of, of, of their work, which, which it certainly is very important. So I wonder if you have thoughts, thoughts on that. Right, I have a number of thoughts on that. Okay, sure. I might surprise you, um, but, uh, but uh, one is, I think the, what a lot of, a lot of minority students and, and women face is isolation in academic departments. So being able to reach out to, to those students and just know that they're included, it doesn't have to be special treatment, but, but just being nice to them and, say, and asking them how are they doing and including them uh, and, and engaging them, that actually goes a long way without having to do a diversity program or anything like that. Um, I think if this is especially important for teaching assistants and research assistants who, who work with, in, with research, in, in research interns from, uh, from other schools. Um, but I think the main thing that you can do uh, and where graduate students, I think, have a lot of power is in reviewing, uh, in the reviewing process for, 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 for academic publications. Um, I think a, a, lot of, a, a lot of us, and this is not a diversity issue for, for ne just necessarily women and minorities, but intellectual diversity. Um, I think when you review and you think about what papers you're gonna include in your citation list, you should try to be as intellectually diverse as possible. And, and, and I think this is where a lot, of, a lot of women and minorities get tripped up because we don't necessarily socialize the same way that that other that other groups might 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 do might might might, uh, might socialize academically and professionally and so 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 being more open as a reviewer and I see this as the editor of a journal which I try to advocate for openness and and uh, and and some understanding in the review process I think that's where graduate students can have can have a big impact uh, on on the not just the the equitability but also the intellectual diversity of a field and don't trust Google Scholar by the way. <laughs> Just want to say that. <laughs> there we go. Hey, Chad, great talk. Uh, one question I have, you mentioned cost. So one issue over here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. So one issue is cost. You touched on this right. a bit. You said 2020 uh, robot would be $40,000. Right. Um, for some people, that's affordable. I don't know about you, but for me, that wouldn't be affordable. Right. Uh, in most programs, it's not going to be. So I'm in Chicago, and there are two schools near me. Uh, one is a private school, is $30,000 a year. They have a big robotics club, they have a huge budget. Right. And then we have a bunch of CPS, Chicago Public Schools, where they have a very, very small budget. Right. And so robotics is not even an option. Right. Um, so clearly, 40000 is not scalable. And I think that's, to me, that's one of the, that's the audience that we need to reach out to is, right. you know, children, fifth grade through high school, to get them working with robots, but not at $40,000. Right. Just wondering what your thoughts are. So, so I think, so for those robots that we have right now, being able to timeshare those robots, uh, through and this is where where access through through network protocols I think make, makes a big difference. The way that we used to timeshare big mi mainframes, I think we can do that to give access to uh, to, um, to to students uh, who, or who don't who don't necessarily have the same the same resources. Forty thousand dollars really is really still is a lot of money. And when I'm saying that, I think that's really for for things that 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 agencies like Medicare, like like uh, like um, I'm sorry. Like, like the VA or the or 
or various other health-related agencies could fund in order to, to, to deal with our massive healthcare issues, especially taking care of our, our aging and disabled population, because that is a big economic driver, uh, a big economic concern. But for education and providing access, time sharing is, is something we can do. We can also, I, I think the way that we teach uh, computer science and robotics is still very much meant for for the more privileged zip codes, to be, to, to be honest. And I think we could, if we changed our approach to teaching, we could also get more students in and, and have them think about you know, simulation as a, as a viable platform as stepping into working with these larger platforms. But eventually, I think 15, you know, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, robots are going to be cheap enough that it's going to be like buying a computer, buying like one of those $5,000 Alienware things. It's going to just be something you just do. And we won't even think about it to the limit, towards the limit. Catherine then Nick. Chad, thank you for the nice talk. This is Catherine. I don't know if you can see me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have two questions. Sure. Uh, <laughs> no, this is great. <laughs> yeah. I, I really appreciated your talk. Yeah. Um, the first thing, I wanted to go back to the point from two speakers ago. We all have biases. Even those of right. us who don't look like the majority of the people here, right. we hold biases and we apply them to the people around us, right. even unintentionally. I have personally thought double-blind review might be a really good plan. I don't want people to be worrying about whether I have a prostate or not when they're <laughs> reviewing my paper, I, you or don't, the, you, the color I, of my skin, or my religion, or my sexual orientation, or that of my students. Is that something you advocate for, or what well, do you think could help right. us? I, I think and I would first advocate for not uh, making sure that, you're, that, that uh, whoever has a prostate, it's not squeezy. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and then, it's then for your good do, health. It's, it's, for, it's, for your good health. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. It's worth it. Um, but uh, but I, I would say, you know, everybody has biases. We all do. You know, and, and, you know, we're not going to get away from those biases. But you should have an awareness when, when you are applying a bias to some. To, you can't to always, though. You, and but, even I right. try to suppress it. But yeah. Like, I have a female PhD student who is amazing. And I didn't on my own think to nominate her for my department's <laughs> best PhD yeah. student award. Right. Luckily, she suggested, and I nominated right. her, and she got it. And it killed me that I didn't think of it on my own. But you recognize the bias, you recognize it when it happened and when somebody brought After it to your it attention. After it happened. You, you may, I mean, all of us are going to make mistakes. We're all human. But when somebody comes to you and says, I think I'm, you know, that you should do, you know, you should think of things this way and, and to be understanding and have that discussion, yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think that's really what, 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 it's, what it's asking for. We can't legislate all of, you know, good behavior. You can just ask these questions to yourself introspectively and are you doing the right thing? Um, and, it, and yeah, I agree. We all should be doing that. When we would grade tests, we wouldn't look at the names of the students. And I think I, I still like this for paper reviews. My second question is: I completely agree. We have huge minority problem in the U.S. Right. I did an REU site. I had tons of minority students. I'm really proud of all of them. I'm worried though that your talk might have given the impression that we don't have as much of a gender problem as we do. When people right. look at me. They guess I'm a secretary, <laughs> not on the football team. Yeah, right, right. But that's what I get. Uh, right. And I just wanted to mention that to you that I think we need to, and we had another speaker or a question. Right. So, so to, just to, to say this, I dry run this with my wife, and she said the exact same thing. Uh, and, 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 and to some extent, there, there's somewhat of a reaction that I have as a minority that when we talk about diversity, it's usually talk, talked about with respect to women. To be honest, white women. Um, and so I'm trying to give a perspective from, I'm trying to give the talk from my perspective. I, 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 I value I, that and right, I, I applaud it. Right. But I would say, and this is what, what I think is, is really important, um, all of, both of, both of, both gender and race and a number of other dimensions are really important and that's, and, and it really isn't about diversity. We need more women or we need more African Americans in, in computing or robotics. The real question is, are we providing equal opportunity? And that's, that, should be the, that should be the thing. It, regardless of, of what your demographic is, are, did you get a shot in order to do your best and be a part of this community? And yeah. that's all that we can ask for. Yeah. Uh, if you don't look like everyone else around you, there's a bit more of a spotlight on you. So you right. can like, try to make the best of it. That's what I've done. Right. One other thing I wanted to and build on. And you've done great, I want to say well, that. Well, you <laughs> too. It's, it's you're, you're looking talking. good in the spotlight <laughs> also. Yeah. But last, last thing is diverse teams tend to come up with better solutions than right. homogeneous teams, whether it's uh, all the things right. we're considering. And so I, I just wanted to pitch that as well. I, so. and, and I think that's, that, that is, that gets to why I'm very proud to be an American, and I think the I think yeah go. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, all right, I'm not going to say the things I'm thinking. I'm just, but, I, but, I, but We'll talk but, more later. But, but, Thank you again. But, 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 <laughs> I, but I am proud of the ideal of, of, of the United States. I'm proud of, of the diversity that we have. We are, we, are, we are a melting pot of ideas, and I think that's what's made us, made us, uh, uh, made us quite strong in a place where people want to come to be educated and be a part of our, our, our economy. So I agree with you completely on that. Thank you again. Thank you. Next. So I, I don't know if that was applause for Catherine and Chad, which, yeah. is, which is very well deserving. But if anybody has another question, we can definitely take uh, we'll, one or two more questions. We'll be in the cat skills next week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Over there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that never gets old, by the way. Sorry, never gets old. <laughs> Gorev got hit on the head. Uh, one thing you didn't mention was. Uh, about reaching into the uh, middle school and high school communities to try right. to address this because when I was doing interviews with students when I was becoming a professor about why students didn't make the decision to go into right. computer science or robotics or any of that stuff, generally they had made a decision way before they got to college about whether or not they were going to a technical field. Right. And so do you feel like it's important to reach back into that and, and are, do you have any ideas on how to get into that? Ab um, absolutely critical. Um, because if we don't have students that are coming in, that are applying and, and willing to, to do computer science or mechanical engineering or electrical, um, you know, when, they, when, the, when the minute they submit their application, we really don't stand a chance. But I think that problem is so much bigger uh, than what I can deal with or what we can deal with as a, as, a, as a research community because it gets to all the issues that go through K through 12 education, which is obsessed with high stakes testing um, and, and teachers are really focused on those things. And, and, and so uh, a lot of times I think the, 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 the problem that we have when we as people at universities try to do diversity and, and, and outreach, education outreach, is we think of it as an intellectual problem. We think of it as, oh, if we just present the idea in a different way, we'll get a better out outcome. But really it's a cultural problem. If, you, if people see others like them who are successful in a field and, and are represented, then they tend to want to do it, they, they tend to want to, to, to gravitate to those fields, or they're more inclined to gravitate to those fields. And so the cultural issue, is, I think, is probably bigger than all the, I am, I am seriously, like, nerd, geek, dork, you know, like, kids see me walking through the door, as soon as I open my mouth, you know, I've lost them, right? The only thing I do is show videos and, the, <laughs> and try to get them back. But, uh, but it has to be somebody else that I think resonates with, with kids to let them know that this is something they want to do. And I, I, that, that, I think, is the biggest issue. Okay, um, so now, uh, before we thank Chad again, uh, there are a few announcements, so just to hang on, uh, Nate and uh, Nick. What? Yeah, yeah. And I just want to make sure nobody get, got up after <laughs> the, the applause. So now we'd like to thank uh, Chad again. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>